Hello and good evening. My name is Pierana Cavalchini. I'm the Tom and Lisa Blumenthal Curator of Contemporary Art at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. And I'm really thrilled to be with you tonight for this program. You know, tonight's virtual program is called The Larger Conversation, Creative Collision, which is related to Gardner's suite of exhibitions, Titian, Women with Myth and Power, The Rape of Europa, Mary Reed Kelly and Patrick Kelly, and Body Language, Barbara Kruger, all currently on view through January 2nd, 2022. Tonight's conversation is part of the Gardner's Museum series, The Larger Conversation. This is a gutsy and innovative conversational series that connects current social, cultural, and global issues with themes including current exhibitions at the Gardner and our founder Isabella Stewart Gardner's story and collection. Through these conversations, we really aim to discover fresh perspectives through authentic discourse between thought leaders, artists, and cultural and social activists. We encourage audience members and participants alike to bear witness to each other's experience through empathy, connection, and vulnerability. I would also like to share some ground rules and helpful hints for having the best experience this evening. The Gardener is an inclusive place that welcomes everyone. To have the best experience today, we recommend that you share questions for speakers with the Q&A and use the chat actively and courteously to continue the conversation. Please be sure to take care of yourself and each other during our time together. Secondly, a live transcript is available during the, this program at the bottom of your screen and will provide captioning. If you have any questions <clears throat> or technical difficulties, please use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. We have support staff monitoring the chat and they will be able to assist you. At the end of the program, there will be an opportunity to ask the panel any questions or share any comments. Just please use the Q&A feature to do so. Finally, this conversation may explore themes of sexual assault, incest, violence, and misogyny. We have worked with the Boston Area Rape Crisis Center to provide resources for survivors of sexual violence and their supporters, and for those who want to take action. We invite you to access these resources and the exhibition resources available on our website and to reflect, learn, and discuss with others tonight. Additionally, we're including resources in the chat recommended by the team at BARC for survivors of sexual violence and their supporters and for all those who want to take action. So before we begin tonight's conversation, I would like to take a moment to share how the gardener approached our exhibitions, Titian, Women, Myth and Power, and The Rape of Europa, Mary Reed Kelly and Patrick Kelly. The foundation of these exhibitions is Gardner's Rape of Europa, one of the most iconic Renaissance artworks in America, painted by the Venetian artist Titian in 1562 and acquired by the museum's founder in 1896. Depicting the central mythological heroine, um, Europa, on the back of God, Jupiter, who has assumed the shape of the bull, the work is a stunning example of Titian's revolutionary painting technique. However, as the title suggests, the painting depicts the, the Europa's, the character's abduction and eventual rape. Titian's other poesies, uh, of which there are five, also called painted poems, like The Rape of Europa, depict stories of sexual violence and coercion, themes not uncommon to Renaissance artists. So we share our founder, Isabella Stewart Gardner's commitment to the living artist, to contemporary artists. This season, engaging with artists who have influenced, who, have, who are influenced by the feminist movement and cultural critique, and in their work, challenge the portrayal and objectification of women in art and society. The two contemporary exhibitions were commissioned to respond to Titian's paintings, and they address similar themes 
on the Museum Anne H. Fitzpatrick facade, Body Language by Barbara Kruger, is a provocative image of two overlapping bodies, male and female, using a detail from Titian's painting, Diana and Acton. And in the video, The Rape of Europa by Mary Reed Kelly and Patrick Kelly on view in the Fenway Gallery, Europa is given agency and voice using sexually explicit language with humor and imagery that purposely contrast with Titian's erotic depictions of the female body. We recognize that sexual violence is far too prevalent in our society. Through our artist projects and collaborations, we support efforts to educate ourselves and others about issues of gender and sexual discrimination and assault. With that said, I would like to introduce our panelists for this conversation, all who collaborated with us on our suite of exhibitions this season. Our first panelist is Jennifer Sorkin. Jennifer is Associate Professor of History of Art at Architecture at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She writes on intersections between gender, material culture, and contemporary art, and working primarily on women artists and underrepresented media. Jennifer publishes widely in museum and exhibition catalog and wrote an essay for Gardner's short run print edition booklet, The Rape of Europa, Mary Reed Kelly and Patrick Kelly. Our second panelist is Jill Burke. Jill is a historian of the body and its visual representation, focusing on Italy and Europe from 1400 to 1700. Currently, she's investigating how people in the Renaissance tried to look good, how they sought to change their bodies, faces, and hairstyles to meet ideals of beauty. She's finishing a book, How to Be a Renaissance Woman, that will be out next year. Jill was also a community collaborator on our exhibition's interpretation, contributing an audio response to one of Titian's poesies, as well as a blog post for the exhibition. Our third and fourth panelists join us from the same screen, Mary Reed Kelly and Patrick Kelly. Mary and Pat are Gardner Museum artists in residence and their film, The Rape of Europa, is on view in our Fenway Gallery. The video is the, is the focus of the booklet um, by that, that, was, that was organized uh, by, the, by the museum and uh, that Jennifer Sor uh, Sorkin wrote a piece for. Mary and Pat create graphically stylist short films and combine painting performance with Mary's distinctive wordplay word rich poetry. Layered by Pat into a densely detailed historically specific collage, the films feature characters whose rhyming punning speech traps them between comic and tragic meanings and whose dilemmas resonate with current problems of ideology and responsibility. Mary Reed Kelly was born in the US in 1979 and she received her BA from St. Olaf College, Minnesota and an MFA in painting from the Yale University in 2009. She is the recipient of the Martha Carther uh, Foundation grant and has received awards from the American Academy in Rome, the Rema Hort Mann Foundation and the Guggenheim Foundation. Patrick Kelly, born in the United States in 1969, earned a BA from St. Olaf's College, Minnesota, and an MFA from Graham Cranbrook Academy of Art in Michigan. His works have been ex exhibited at the Bibliothèque Publique d'Information at the Centre Pompidou in Paris, France, the Kunsthalle Dusseldorf in Germany, and the Minnesota Museum of American Art. So please give a warm welcome to our slate of panelists and let's jump right into the questions. Well, since opening Titian Women, Myth and Power, uh, there's been a push to understand how these paintings would have been viewed and understood during the Renaissance. With that said, when Titian created the poesies, the paintings were not at all publicly accessible and were on view for a very select group of individuals in the court of Philip II of Spain. So in their original context, Jill, were these images understood for their depictions of object objectification and violence against women? And how did the Renaissance understanding about feminine nudity and violence shape what types of depictions were acceptable in painting and art? 
And our understanding of these images, like Titian's poesies that objectify and victis, uh, victimize women, how have they changed? You have. That's quite a big question, and, and I'll, I'll take it, uh, it step by step. So um, there's not a huge amount known about the very original uh, setting of Titian's paintings. We know they're in a small room. They're intended for Philip, and they would have been intended for him and some intimate friends or um, people at the Spanish court. Um, Spain particularly had a lot of taboos against nakedness and against female sexuality um, and representations of this um, more than other European countries. So um, they, uh, a generation after Philip II, they started to have um, reserved rooms um, that were kind of just for aristocrats just for men to see these images. Um, so no, not at all. These images are not intended for a general audience. Um, and they were, um, it would have been thought, I suppose, quite shocking for some people, for women and children particularly to have seen them. Uh, yeah. Um, I suppose that's just the other point I'd like to make is that it's also an elite audience. And so the other thing is that inherent in these images um, is the idea that they'd only be seen by people who knew classical texts um, and who could relate to them in the, in the so-called correct way. Um, so there's all, all these images that are already kind of gendered and the ideas of the audience of, of these images are, are gendered and classed um, already right from the start, right from when they were made. They, they, it, they weren't assumed to be seen by everybody. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to, to, to I can, I've got more I can say about ideas of rape in the Renaissance and um, ideas of uh, how um, women's agency and, and lack of agency in this, but I don't know if anyone else wants to come in first. Or shall I go on? Yes, please do. Yeah, okay, so um, there's there's a very f really fundamentally different idea of what rape is in the Renaissance. It's not thought to be a crime against individual women. It's more to be thought to be a crime against property. Um, so there's two different types of rape, and they're both relating to whether the woman is under the charge of her father or under the charge of her husband. And so the rape of people who are under the charge of their father, whom are virginal, is thought to be much worse than the rape of, say, a married woman. Um, and generally, if um, non-married women were raped, um, they would some they would go to court. The perpetrator would go to court, and the desired outcome was marriage between the rape victim and the person and, and the rapist. Um, so it's completely different idea of, of what should happen. Um, and rape is often used as a kind of dramatic um, hinge in Renaissance dramas. And this is what Titian is doing in his paintings here, um, saying the rape of Europa um, is using this as a kind of central dramatic narrative. What's got about to happen to Europa is that she's going to be about to be raped and then she's going to be kind of become the queen and the founder of Europe. Um, so there's this whole idea when you look at the drama of Titian's painting, um, and we're meant to be, I think, you know, follow it avidly and be really excited and feel all these things with Europa and feel how the kind of uh, what it's like to be kind of transported. And there is Titian's quite unusual in that he's interested in the emotion of his characters and including his female characters. That's not typical in the Renaissance, um, but it's also um, about how in the Renaissance ideas, her suffering is both emblematic of the suffering of a wider people, of the suffering of Europe, but also it's um, her suffering is going to be worth it in the end. So most ideas of rape in the Renaissance are about this is going to be awful, but then it's going to be fine because you're going to get married or, you know, Europe is going to be founded or, or, or whatever um, the, the, the particular story is. So then it's a form of anointing or women's bodies become uh, subjugated to the state or the larger populace, we might yeah. say. Exactly. It's like a vehicle. Uh, women's bodies become a kind of vehicle for the sacrifice that, that women sacrifice themselves for the, for the greater good. Um, so this is the idea. And then women's bodies also become a metaphor for the subjugation of certain peoples in the state for the, for the greater good as well. Which is what Europa herself would represent because she's not uh, she's a non-white body. Ultimately. That's it. And uh, I mean, the other thing, of course, is in this period, it's a period of colonialism. 
So Philip II, um, as as king of Spain, is uh, you know the, the Spanish Empire is expanding um, into what was then called the New World, um, and so this also going on kind of alongside these poesies, a whole a whole story of conquest and colonization. Are there any um, stories or narratives in Renaissance? or even ancient literature in which um, a female speaker who's kind of gone through this ordeal of kidnapping and rape and then been elevated through marriage and bearing children about how it was a good bargain and she's glad she took it? I think um, now, you know, <laughs> getting out of the, the back of my mind, but I think the story of, of, of Flora and I, I don't know if you can bring to mind Botticelli's Primavera um, where, um, uh, Chloris and nymph Chloris, Chloris is raped by um, the wind god Zephyr and turns into Flora, um, the goddess of spring. And Flora does say something along the lines in, in Poliziano's, I mean, it's written by a man, right? But um, in Poliziano's um, account of this tale, she talks about, and I think it's in Ovid as well, she talks about how wonderful it is now that she's a goddess of spring. So it is kind of directly she's given that voice to talk about how this ordeal was worth it. Um, it's really hard to find first person narratives from actual, from women who've been raped, but you do get some of them in court cases in the 16th and 17th century. Um, historians, social historians like Elizabeth Cohen has found out that actually women do think of themselves as having agency in securing marriage after rape. Um, so it's a little bit, women aren't always victims. Um, even in places where they don't have, you know, times in history when they don't have agency, um, you know, what we would think of as much agency, they still manage to try and work the system. And there's the example of Artemisia. Yeah, that's a great example. Um, Artemisia Gentileschi, of course, who um, managed to come back very strongly from her sexual assault when she was, she was 18 or 19. Um, and, you know, Artemisia is not the only person who was making images of men getting their comeuppance, you know, not the only woman. There's a lot of embroidery, for example, from the 16th and 17th century, when women, you know, embroider men having their heads chopped off and things um, in these stories as well. <laughs> so there's obviously, you know, what we see with Artemisia has a chord with other women in this period. When you said women embroidering pictures of men getting their heads cut off, I could immediately see the bio tapestry in my mind. And of course, they're they're yeah, not the, they're yeah. not the ones actually wielding the weaponry in the imagery in the imagery, but they did make it. So, <laughs> and you know, the Judith and Holofernes is uh, you know where Judith does chop his head off is a really popular subject in embroidery, mm. and you know we might think of embroidery as quite a refined. Um, and obviously very painstaking and slow and skilled thing. But at the same time, there's real, you know, you can have quite passionate embroidery, I think, you know, when this is the main way that women can express themselves creatively in this period is, is via needlework. Mm -hmm. And even later into the 18th and 19th century. Yeah, right, abs uh, absolutely right. And yeah. we might think of that as a form of um, agency and somebody like Rosika Parker, who wrote the subversive stitch in the late seventies was trying to yeah. recover the history of embroidery as a subversive medium in which women who were forced to do the drudgery of samplers um, were somehow embroidering their own hatred for the medium um, as part of it. <laughs> or political messaging or what have you. Mm -hmm. It's difficult sometimes to, when you look at something like Titian's um, paintings that are in this exhibition, um, the poetry paintings, it seems, and this has been something that's said by art historians, that it's a closed, it's a closed circuit of men. A man's painting them, men are looking at them, um, you know, men are discussing them, they're written about by men. And so, you know, it does involve some kind of creative um, thinking. Um, to display them in a way that accounts for, you know, what the, what's happening, thinks about what's happening to the women in them and what's happening to the women that have looked at them ever since. Um, 
but uh, and it's really good to see the this exhibition doing it um, this exhibition thinking about these images actually of images of sexual assault and, and making that connection because it's been a frustration often for me um, in the past that the that renaissance images are often shown as quite um, toothless as as quite not disturbing as just being about the great artists mm. and not about having any kind of emotional heft um, and I think that's where Mary Mary and Pat's work comes in though is as it yeah. becomes a kind of response um, and responsiveness and a much more uh, a 21st century reckoning um, with mm. how to re-envision or uh, retell the story of Europa in post-colonial and more contemporary terms um, without losing the the kind of symbolism of Europa who becomes uh, almost like an entitled millennial in the video um, <laughs> and representative of a, a kind of generational stance versus being an actual person. Mm -hmm. I mean, <clears throat> yeah, the, the emotional complexity of the Titian paintings and especially the Europa really struck us immediately the first time we got to really spend time with the painting at the Gardner and um, you know it was and it was really helpful to know and to have Jill explain to us all that the paintings were really made for for a closed set for an elite and very male set because one of our first impressions seeing the painting was that it was funny there was a clear slapstick quality in the way that Europa is kind of tumbling off the back and her skirts flying up in a very Marilyn predicting way. And, um, and you know, the Cupid and the, and the fish are kind of mimicking what she's doing. And so it's, it's clearly fun. And, and, and of course the bull's face, which is probably my favorite part of the painting is just kind of like, did you get that? <laughs> like almost like waiting for the, uh, you know, for the laugh. But then, of course, you know, famously, her her face is in the shadow, um, and so like, Titian is is acknowledging that she's experiencing a real annihilation, and um, so, to us, when we those two facets, the being funny, and also acknowledging the severity of of the crime and of the the absolute destruction of the being, those two things were basically the tone that we felt like we had to strike. Mm. But that that's that beginning of the of the joke of the painting, you know, from what I understand, the, the Europa is the last painting Titian made for the king. And so it, you know, there was this bond made, this intimacy. And, and like a joke just like cements the, the power of mm -hmm. these two incredibly um, yeah, powerful men, the king and this, you know, extremely eminent and well-known painter. I think it's such an interesting painting because you have these kind of dissonant, this dissonance between some parts of it. You know, there's, I think the most, for me, the most distressing things is the fabric on the painting. You know, there's a lot of emotional weight in this kind of, fabric that's flying mm -hmm. um and it seems almost like that there's terror and there's movement and there's time happening in in the fabric and and you know you look at them all together and that was it. and I have you know seeing them all together it's been really uh, was was wonderful but there's a lot of emotion placed in material um in in Titian and I think that's really interesting but this we, there is some dissonance between like the particularly the bull <laughs> it's like it's really big eyes you know these yeah. beautiful big eyes and then cute. I mean it's <laughs> really cute yeah, yeah. and then and then the kind of and yeah she's flailing you know that in a in a way that's not it's not elegant right and that's so unusual when you see renaissance nudes uh, you know female nudes particularly on paint they're all kind of taking a, a wonderful balanced stance but she's like, clearly there's so much time you can see what her arm is falling back so yeah I, I think it's um you know the last one and I think it's in some ways the one that's most complicated mm -hmm. um because of this mixture of 
feelings that sometimes don't seem to go together at all. It's like there's a whole story. It's like you can see that there's a story and, 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 and it is like, you know, an epic poem, like it's meant to be. Um, but no, it's really, yeah, it's one of my, it, it, it's, I remember going to Boston a long time ago to see it and really thinking, wow. Isn't this is it, quite though, a form of humiliation though because she's really tumbling backwards and it becomes a, oh, yeah. you know it's it's certainly it, she's a subjugated being and and they might be laughing at her expense uh certainly um and i think that that's something that mary and pat you both underscore in your 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 responsive video in the sense that there is uh, a kind of laughing with Europa and then laughing at Europa that's cemented mm -hmm. through um, the poetic text that is her her own um, transcript, her, her own poetry. And so I think it's there's something really interesting there about the layered um, approach to humor that do you want to could you talk a bit about that um, and about the, the desire to use limericks um, and what it means to also have expanded because you go far beyond the, the painting itself to incorporate a whole lot of uh, historical material that's beyond Western mythology and is about a kind of um, innovation and invention of women in different parts of the world uh, for agriculture, for literature, for uh, beer. Uh, and, and it's you know this, this very layered approach that's fascinating. I just, well, I just wanted to say that when we, when we say that we um, both saw this humor in the painting, mm -hmm. it's, we have to qualify that with almost like it's humor with a patina. And I feel like Jill described what that patina, at least for us is, which is knowing who the initial audience was, this closed audience of all men, man painting for other men. And so the humor we're perceiving we're perceiving that sort of one layer remove of humor in the sense that it was done with this inside joke, which arguably is, you know, is, it's kind of this fetishizing violence kind of humor that we're perceiving in it. So then that as a starting point for us led to our own humor. It did. And I think, you know, to kind of circle back to what Jenny was asking about in terms of kind of the broad palette that our film takes um, in terms of women through time. There's a lot of Neolithic imagery in our film from basically the whole Mediterranean basin of kind of this, this ancient um, Bronze Age and Neolithic civilization. So from, some Afri from Africa, from the Middle East and from what we now consider Europe. Um, you know, that was when Europa was kidnapped, she went, you know, she was taken to Crete and Crete is kind of at the center of this wheel. Um, and we tried to take from all spokes in the wheel, but um, to, to us and, you know, we had to go to all these places for, for imagery and for ideas. But of course, Titian achieves this all in, in one image, one painting. What he achieves, I think, is to like put in front of us this, to this, very foundational question of what is civilization and how does it form and is it is it necessary that coercion is is always a foundational ingredient and i think that as difficult as it can be to look at a rape being celebrated in a painting to to us we felt that titian was offering a difficult truth that civilization as we've known it, and certainly uh, if you can you know, use kind of a compromise term like Western civilization, um, it's certainly foundational. <laughs> and I think that that's what the story is of. It's, but it's more than just saying, look, this is, this is part of the deal, which is kind of why I asked Jill about like, are there any, um, poems or uh, pieces in which women are kind of accepting the deal because when we were looking at the Europa, we felt that it wasn't just Titian saying that coercion and violence are, are part of a package of civilization, but 
when we think about women particularly and, and the bargain that they make here, I think they're being coerced into not just acceptance, but forgiveness. Mm. And saying, I, 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 it, if I get a crown or if I get a family of children that you know, become kings or something, mm. then it's worth it. And so it's not just the body that's being coerced, it's the emotions. It's, it's I think I mean in terms in the terms of the period I mean that absolutely fits because what women the the deal that women are making is 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 marriage you know and there's not having a decent marriage that you women don't have choices in the same way you can't choose to have you know and um, to go and have a, a job that's financially viable for you to you know to wait to marry or um you know most women so, so that's the, that is the deal that people are making is this forgiveness, you know, that you'll marry the person who raped you and you'll forgive them for the, for the, for, you know, any violence against your person and you'll forget in order to become married and to leave your birth family. So and also that, the birthright of passing down the lineage that in fact, women, yeah. women's bodies at this moment are only are only as good as her ability to reproduce and that Europa yeah. becomes, uh, you know, pregnant with twins uh, and gives birth to uh, the former or what becomes the king of Minos um, uh, and uh, a, a, a different prince. Um, I don't remember exactly who I have to go look them up, but um, <laughs> uh, they become, you know, precursors to uh, other kinds of powerful, she is birthing powerful men. And that, that you know, that is the, the role of women is um, uh, her body as a scheme of production for yeah. empire and, building. And ultimately she's birthing um, the Habsburgs and Philip II, right. you know, this is the idea. Um, so this is uh, his foundation story mm -hmm. as well is, is, in, is in Europa. Mm -hmm. um, and also so like a divine birthright right yeah, yeah. This, you know, they, you, and what I love about your work um, Mary and Pat is that you have given her a voice yeah and she is kind of whiny like like Jenny has said and um, you know uh, we we wanted her to have a class identity like we want her to be we wanted her to be a contemporary woman you can tell she's a professional woman because she's wearing a badge on a lanyard and she's got like a stylish haircut and she's wearing office clothes essentially that have that have been shredded and she's not very sympathetic because that's not that's not the basis of justice is whether the victim is sympathetic or not and i guess what's more important is is it europa seems to not in our film europa seems to not really know what's happened she seems to be kind of piecing it together as we go through the film and i actually find that that's a very with some types of assault and violence it can take a long time to realize what's happened um certainly in cases like date rape or things that you think just were an, an accident or something a misunderstanding and this is kind of how you're coached to interpret it to make as few waves uh, in your circles as possible. So we kind of see Europa basically piecing it together. Um, that was kind of our way of acknowledging like a, one reality of assault, one common reality of assault. And she's also the right age. Can, can, I, can we just point out that she's, she's a kind of 20 something who would be in a, a differential power relationship in which uh, somebody, probably a man, would be much more powerful than her in the workplace, in this quasi-professional situation in which she has found herself, um, you know, mistreated. And, and that this is, this is actually the age that is um, most commonly targeted. It's, uh, you know, there's something like uh, every 68 seconds, there's somebody in this country who's the victim of sexual violence, um, but the majority of the victims are um, under 25. Um, and so that, you know, that this is like the, the right age to really think about um, her. And I can't help but think about, you know, simultaneous to the run of this show, we have all these other things happening 
Um, in pop culture, uh, for instance, the run of the impeachment series on television of, of the revamp of relooking uh, at a more in a very sympathetic way at Monica Lewinsky's plight uh, as a young woman, an intern in the in the Clinton era White House. Uh, we had testimony today um, uh, from Representative Cory Bush. Uh, about uh, abortion after rape um, and the idea of trying to keep abortion legal. So these are these are not issues that um, are just circling around a painting. They are issues that are actually pressing and contemporary uh, to the point where you know I just want to the 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 kind of amazing quote of Cory Bush today, who is a Democrat from uh, Missouri, uh, and she said. You know, I'm going to quote this, we live in a society that has failed to legislate love and justice for all. So we deserve better, we demand better, we are worthy of better. And, you know, th that's, that's a very activist statement. Um, and, you know, she's advocating for women. Well, Jenny, this makes me want to ask you, as a historian with a lot of knowledge of contemporary art and recent art, with so many real examples and real materials before us, um, does it still make sense to look at Renaissance models at all? Or, or is, is it even appropriate to fictionalize? Like, what do you think the role is of fiction and art with such a real and terrible subject? Um, I think that we, we are inculcated to still teach the Western canon in some way uh, in art and literature. Uh, you know, the Renaissance is not my area personally, but it does infiltrate um, understandings of contemporary art, certainly. Uh, it's still a passing down and passing on. And I think that, that contemporary artists are always responding to something that came before that's kind of the nature of the avant-garde is that you're responding or throwing over a previous generation of practitioner and i think that this is this certainly qualifies to me in that vein um, of taking on a difficult subject matter uh, and turning it on its head and i think that this work would have been um you know impossible for a uh, an institution like the Gardner to put on view. I think it's a it's a gutsy move to put it on view um, in in the so called revered space um, that is Western high art. Um, so I'm wondering if Pirana actually wants to address that, what that means, and internally if there were you know big conversations about this. Yes, we had many conversations, but we and we actively decided um, to find uh, a con the contemporary artists who could respond to the painting um, with the idea that it would be a very strong contemporary response and Marion Patter, amazing. And there's a sharpness and, there's, and they're so brilliant. And, and it was, a, I think the right voice. And they did this amazing piece that took over a year and a half to make. Also perhaps because of um, COVID that lengthened the time uh, that they had on it, but it's so layered, it, it's amazing. And to have it in the gallery, to have it in the Fenway gallery between you know, the blue room and the, and the yellow room is, is quite extraordinary. Uh, and we've had you know, incredible people, who, so many people who have come to watch it with a wide range of responses, obviously. Um, but that's what art should do. And, that, and there's nothing more interesting than uh, pitting a sort of uh, historic art uh, mm -hmm. to contemporary art and allowing it to speak to each other, which is what we are trying to do here at the Gardner. And, and can I just say about the Renaissance stuff, just to come in about whether we should be looking at these paintings. I think if we're gonna be looking at them, we should be looking at them like this, mm. critically. Yeah. And thinking about, I think it's really important actually to look at them critically and really important to think about what is the tradition that is called the Western tradition and what does that, who's, who are the losers in this tradition? You know, who, who, who is this, this tradition? Who are the heroes and, and what are the assumptions that we have? So I think it's important to look at it, but in a way, in a different way. And I think galleries and museums are going to have to you know, have a have a bit of a reckoning now about their collections and about what the assumptions that they're kind of carrying on, beaming out of their gallery walls uh, about women and about, you know, all 
a, a lot of different groups that are just not present or or subordinate in that tradition. Also, the internalized uh, sexism that would have been present even in uh, Isabella Stewart Gardner's own purchase sure. of this painting mm -hmm. that she, you know, she's not a proto feminist. She's a proto feminist in certain ways, and in others, she's very much um, of her own time and place. And so, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, to the term rape, even though it's in the painting, doesn't come up, I'm guessing, in her correspondence as something to push back on. It's, it's mm -hmm. a piece of, to celebrate as part of her collection. I mean, I kind of want Pat to talk a little bit about, because we, we actually felt like it was, the context was important of the museum was, because the museum is where we encounter these things from the past. And we felt like it was important to show the museum, a version of the museum in, in our film. And so Pat made this really detailed version of the gardener's courtyard. Yeah, well, no, <clears throat> knowing that it was going to be shown where Piranha just described it would be shown, um, just feet from the courtyard and having spent a month in, in residence at the museum and when you when you spend time in that place that that amount of kind of repetitive living there time you start to see it as a house again i think <laughs> isabella's house and, and and in that sense pretty weird house <laughs> in the sense of it being a, an amazing space uh, uh filled with filled with art and so we really wanted to have that sense of that space there but our version of it so we decided to just completely rebuild our, our version of a, I guess, arguably kind of post-apocalyptic version of the courtyard, but the courtyard nonetheless, you can recognize it as such and have kind of leave that unexplained, just have it be Europa's set, Europa's character set. But it's also a spectre, like a, if the Titian is a specter of violence, so is, this courtyard, this post-apocalyptic courtyard of like a, you know, mm -hmm. beloved museum, beloved public space, um, kind of cast down, and then in a way it, to respond to kind of Titian's um, picture of like the origins of civilization to see the end of civilization. Mm -hmm. You know, when museums are all thrown over and and of course we hope it's not going to be post-apocalyptic but of course all civilizations do have to come to an end and so we did kind of want that type of time scale um thank you all uh you know for sharing and um i think we have quite a few questions from the audience tonight and um i would like to start with one of them and you could answer them um, this, well, this is one, uh, Mary and Pat, you created this work during the pandemic. Did this impact where you were coming from and the choices you made? It really did. Um, and I'll just start off by saying what a really practical effect was to us, just as people working in our studio, we found that kind of in the midst of like, and it wasn't just the pandemic, it was also the George Floyd uprisings um, at the same time that we were making the work. And um, so, yeah, just this, this terrible attachment like to the news and seeing what's happening and trying to come to terms with it. We, fo we found, I found myself remaking things for the film over and over. So mm -hmm. like, you know, when I made Europa's eyes, which are kind of almost, they work like kind of a swim goggle thing. They've got little elastic and I put, you know, wear them like goggles. I remade them three times. Cause I, like I could, I felt like I, uh, it was not, it absolutely had to be better. Like nothing was good enough. Um, I was the same way. I mean, I just kept reworking and reworking things. And it was this sense of, um, Anytime I started to feel a kind of welling up of anxiety about how long something was taking or what, you know, do I really want to redo this? The, the, the broader situation, the broader reality just basically said, stop worrying about stuff like that. Just 
take your time and redo it, rework it. But I think it wasn't just a, a general anxiety about how bad things were. It was kind of a civilizational anxiety mm -hmm. because you know we're looking at these these terrible existential threats, the the virus, but also uh, just our our absolute inability to to achieve a state of, of basic uh, fairness where where people can just live their lives and and not be murdered by agents of the state. Um, so to to try to come to grips with making things and being being part of culture i think was part of why we kept remaking things and starting over with mm -hmm. the film mm -hmm. yeah. karana you're so muted muted so sorry there's a question for jill um what if the rapist is already married with a family Oh, you mean in the in actually in real life <laughs> in the Renaissance? In the um, in that case, he pays money for the for the um, victim's dowry. This is what actually happened to Artemisia Gentileschi. Um, um, they tried to make her her attacker marry her, but he was already married, and so he was asked to pay a fine um, um, towards her dowry. But it can be very difficult for. Um, um, uh, young women in that position to find a husband um, because virginity is so prized at that time. Um, so it's not as, uh, in, in, in the thought of that time, it's not as good an outcome, but basically it's a monetary outcome. He will pay money towards her dowry so she can get married more easily, uh, hopefully uh, to someone else. Here's another question. I think it's interesting that Titian shows the family and people on the shore. Presumably, presumably those uh, were, um, were friends of Europa where she was when she was abducted. Why do you think Titian included them? Was it, was there, what is their significance to us looking at the painting now? Um, well, they are friends of Europa. So it's part of the story is that Europa went with her friends to the shore um, to kind of, I don't know, um, um, have a nice time, have a kind of picnic outside. And then this beautiful white bull came and um, they covered, because the bull was so beautiful, they covered him with garlands and Europa thought he was so beautiful, but she got on his back. So part of the, part of the story, there's a play that was written just before Titian's painting that talks about this. And part of the reason is because Europa dared to get on the bull's back and so in some way she's implicated um she's partly to blame for what happens next um but that but so and i think titian includes a friend partly to show the um the kind of uh, terror and panic of them losing her on the shore and that's also in the in, in the play so 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 that's that's i think what the what the meaning is of those uh, there's another question here. Uh, the crudeness itself and the embrace of the vulgar language can also be seen as a form of agency. It that is was my comment. <laughs> oh, it was your comment. Oh, sorry. Yes, it was my response to the question. There's a very good question um, from Gloria Sutton about um, time-based media uh, and the idea that video's own history of marginality uh, becomes counter to the weight of the genre of painting itself and the idea of uh, I think putting forward this a, a video response and a, a time-based media, which is um, somehow more instantaneous or it, it's moving images. Uh, and the history of video art is really marginalized um, and probably not that often seen um, in contemporary spaces, uh, or sorry, in, in historic museums. Uh, so I'm wondering if, if Mary and Pat want to respond to that question. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it, it may be not as marginalized anymore, um, but I do, I really like that observation of um, this, our, our work being video in the presence of this painting <laughs> as at that, just that act itself being a kind of statement of, a counterstatement, I guess. 
I mean, <clears throat> if you look at painting as a category and video as a category, painting has immense prestige. I mean, mm -hmm. these objects from, from the moment Titian was asked to make them, that, that was, that's their job is to announce the, uh, the absolute pinnacle of prestige and wealth. And, um, and even the fact that Philip had them privately, I think also adds another layer to the prestige. They weren't even meant for display, you know, it's not, not really meant to show off, just meant to kind of add an extra layer of social cohesion and that, you know, top band of courtiers that were, you know, admitted to the privilege of seeing them. And so this is still like a role that painting plays today in private homes and, and you know, in, in the spectacle of public auction and um, the prices of paintings and, and video really doesn't uh, work on those, those, that, those types of, of levels. I don't think, um, and I mean, I think that that's okay. I, as you know, so you know, we've been doing this for a little over ten years, and I think it can be to to watch some of our peers whose paintings are extremely prized and sought after and bought and and then like flipped and sold. Um, you know, to, to watch, to, to read the glee of Isabella when she captures this painting and it is a capture of the painting. You know, that's how, that's very much that kind of glee and, and public bragging and like showing off of, you, you know, your, your loot. This is still the fate of paintings. And, and um, I think it must be, you must really have to learn to live with that as, as a sought after painter. And uh, as video artists, we are insulated from it. <laughs> Um, there's another question uh, from the audience. Um, thinking about the installation in the Titian room itself, if you take a Europa in the totality of setting of the Titian room, there's a picture of Christ carrying the cross with a tear, which is right before the Europa. I've always taken that as a Isabella's sensibility to the significant, to the significant, to the meaning of Europa. What are your thoughts about that? Mm -hmm. You mean like that Europa is being sacrificed in the way that Christ was? That's the question. They... I, mean, I, I totally agree because to go back to kind of our earlier, what we were talking about, you know, Christ is the, is the figure that says like, I'm, I'm happy to die. That is the point of my birth is to, you know, be crushed under an unimaginable violence and to have the violence be redeemed through my life and in a way Titian is redeeming this terrible violence that he's showing us through the sheer beauty and the glamour of the paintings and the color. But I also wonder if she wasn't thinking about a, a kind of response, you know, a, mm -hmm. a conversation between the paintings, mm -hmm. not necessarily equating them, mm -hmm. but like Christ, well, the, you know, the, him, the, the, he's suffering for, her or if you're feeling her suffering mm -hmm. or something, but wow. I don't know if anything is known about that. So I believe that's all the time we have for audience questions. And I'd like to thank um, Jenny, Jill, Pat, Mary for their insight and candor with us for the past hour. I'd like to thank you all for joining us for this conversation and for sharing your stories and asking wonderful questions of our panelists. We're adding some links in the chat uh, for more information about Gardner's uh, Museum's Titian Women Myth and Power Exhibition, upcoming programs, and we hope you will join us, including an evening of film screenings with an artist talk back with our two panelists today, tonight, Mary and Pat, and with links to our store to purchase the two catalogs and the booklet um, connected to Titian Women Myth and Power, The Rape of Europa, Mary Reed Kelly and Patrick Kelly. So Titian, Women, Myth and Power will be open through January 2nd, 2022. You can purchase a time ticket on our website. The Gardner's Museum's website is gardnermuseum.org or use the link in the chat. And on behalf of all of us, we thank you for joining us. Have a great evening, everyone. Bye.